I invite you this morning to please take God's Word and open to the book of Daniel, chapter number 9. The book of Daniel, chapter 9. During this Advent season, we're looking at Old Testament prophecies that deal with the coming of the Messiah. And I want us to look at Daniel, chapter 9, and look at verse number 20. And um, we'll start at verse 20, but actually, I'm just going to read verse 24 and verse 25. If you'll stand for the reading of God's Word. Daniel, chapter 9, verse 24 and verse 25. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem Unto the Messiah, the prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublous times. Thank you so very much. You may be seated. May God bless his word to our hearts today. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for the worship that we've experienced already here today. And now we know that a big part of worship is hearing your word And we know, Lord, it's through your word that you speak to hearts. So, Father, I pray that the Spirit of God will move in hearts and lives and that that the word of God will be used to strengthen the faith of those who are here. And for those who are here that have never trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, that they would see that Jesus indeed is the true Messiah, the Savior, the only hope of salvation and eternal life. And may they come to Christ, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, one of the more mysterious parts of the Christmas story is the wise men who came to Jerusalem seeking the the baby that was born king of the Jews. Did you ever ask yourself the question, how did they know when the Messiah would be born? Matthew chapter 2 calls these men the Magi. Uh, This group of men are also mentioned, this cast of men are mentioned in the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. And one of the titles given to Daniel Uh, You may not know this, but one of the titles given to him was the chief of the Magi. That's in Daniel chapter 2, verse number 48. Now, I think that there's no doubt that Daniel shared with this cast of men the prophecies that he had and perhaps other Old Testament prophecies about the coming of the Messiah. And I think that those prophecies and the interpretations of those prophecies were perhaps passed down through the years among this cast of men called the Magi. And one of those prophecies is found here in the book of Daniel, chapter number 9. This is an amazing prophecy. This is one of the most complex and detailed prophecies in all of the Word of God. In fact, some scholars consider Daniel chapter 9, verses 20 to 27, to be the greatest single defense for the inspiration of Scripture. Now, why? Well, because it precisely states when the Messiah would come to the earth. In fact, Sir Isaac Newton, do you recognize that name? Uh, Sir Isaac Newton once wrote a discourse on this whole passage, and in it he said this. He said, we could stake the truth of Christianity on this prophecy alone made five centuries before uh, Christ. And I think that he was right. And Isaac Newton also wrote about a time in the end when a body of men who would turn uh, to th- their attention to the prophecy of the Word of God, and they would insist upon the literal interpretation uh, of these prophecies in the midst, he said, of clamor and resistance. And I think, again, he is right. As we study Old Testament prophecies like this, we can see why these prophecies have to be interpreted literally. And so I want us to examine this prophecy here this morning, and hopefully this will give you some insight into um, the, the coming of the Messiah, how it was predicted and prophesied in the Old Testament. And beloved, Jesus came right on time in the fullness of time, right as God sovereignly had planned. So first of all, I want you to see this whole narrative. First of all, the, I want to call this the prayer. Look in verse number 20 of Daniel chapter 9. And he says, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. Now, Israel, because of their disobedience and their idolatry, 
were punished by God and they were carried away into exile. You may remember that in the history of Israel. They were carried away as, Babel, as Babylonian captives into the land of Babylon as they were defeated by Nebuchadnezzar and his armies. Daniel was one of them. He went to Babylon when he was just a teenager. However, when we come to Daniel chapter 9, he has been in captivity for a long time, he and the Jewish people. In fact, as, at this writing in chapter 9, Daniel is now an old man. And Daniel was reading from the prophet Jeremiah, and in his reading he discovered that the, pro that the captivity would only last 70 years. And Daniel began to do the calculations in his mind, and he came to the conclusion that the captivity for his people, the Jews, was just about over. So his heart was filled with hope. And he begins to pray fervently. And he's praying here in verse number 20 of chapter 9. Daniel had some questions in his mind because previously God talked about a future indignation in chapter 8, verse 19. And Daniel was wondering, wondering what is this future indignation? If, if, if the people have already served their captivity, what indignation is this talking about? And so Daniel is praying and he's asking God for more understanding. Second part of this is what I call the prophecy. While he's praying, look at verse 21. Yea, and while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. Daniel, we could say, was touched by an angel here. As he was praying, the Bible says God sent the angel Gabriel to him. I can imagine Daniel there on his knees. He's praying fervently. And Daniel says, the man, Gabriel, he appeared as a man because angels could take on a human form in Scripture. This is uh, shown to us several times. And he makes this great announcement. A Gabriel, by the way, was the angel that seemed to make a lot of great announcements about the birth of the Messiah. You remember, he told Mary about uh, the coming Christ child, Jesus. He told Zechariah about John. And now here he comes and he tells Daniel about a prophecy. And notice it says, he, he touched me about the evening oblation. This was the evening sacrifice. Actually, it was really, really around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. If, if Daniel were back in Israel, that would be the time when they would be at the temple uh, offering a sacrifice and praying for the sins of the people. But now here he is away in Babylon. There is no more temple. They would use that time in the evening to pray. And Daniel is praying. And while he's praying, Gabriel comes and he teaches him, look in verse number 22, and he informed me and talked with me and said, oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. Uh, skill here is to give insight, to give wisdom. In verse 23, and at the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved, and therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. Gabriel says, Daniel, you are valued by God. You are beloved by God. Daniel was a faithful man of God, a prophet of God, living a godly life in a pagan land, and God had a special love for Daniel. And Gabriel says, now, I want you to understand, and God wants you to understand what is going to happen and to come with God's people, your people, the Jews. Now, this is the third part, what I want to call the period. Look in verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Seventy weeks, he says, are determined upon thy people. What does this mean, 70 weeks? The Hebrew literally reads 70 sevenths. The number seven has literally been stamped all over the history of Israel, and you know that if you study God's word. In the beginning, there, there was a Sabbath of days. Exodus 23 tells us that. They also had a Sabbath of years. They were to let the land rest on the seventh year, and of course, God's people violated that law, and that's why one of the reasons they were carried away into captivity, God wanted the land to rest. And they had a Sabbath of Sabbaths every 50th year, that was set apart as the year of Jubilee. But now here, Daniel is being introduced to a new set of Sabbaths, we could say, or a new series of Sabbaths, a 70 weeks, or we could say seven-year periods. And years is what is in view here. Scholars see this as the only thing that makes sense here. There will be 77-year 
periods, which makes the total of, I'm not good at math, but it's 490 years. In other words, there are 490 years that God has set apart for the Jewish people where God is going to work. God said, all that I have planned for Israel will be completed in 70 seven-year periods or 490 years. Now, now I would just warn you in advance, we're going to you're going to have to listen on purpose here, okay? We're going to talk about numbers, which I'm not really good at math. But, so if I'm wrong on my numbers, you can correct me afterwards here. But now let me just say this. On our calendar, there are 365 days in a year. However, we need to understand that on a Jewish calendar, there are 360 days in a year. Now how do we know this? Well, there are passages in the, in the Old Testament that tell us this. There are three passages in Genesis that let us know that the Jews reckoned their year 360 days. For example, in Genesis 7, we are told that the flood began on the 17th day of the second month and ended on the 17th day of the seventh month. So the, so, so the flood lasted five months, right? In the same chapter, it says that the waters flooded the earth for 150 days. Simple division will show us that the months were 30 days, therefore, in duration. But also in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, chapter 11, verse 3, and chapter 12, verse 6, the apostle John counts three and a half year, that three and a half year period as 1,260 days, again, indicating a 360 day year. Now, just kind of tuck that information away because we're going to need that as we look at this prophecy a little bit closer. So we see the prayer. We see the prophecy, we see the period, but then the people, again in verse number 24, where it says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. And I want you to focus on that word determined because, again, it lets us know that God is in control. God has determined this. God has decreed this. And upon thy people, this prophecy revolves around Daniel's people. And again, who is that? Very simply, that is the Jewish people. People. God is saying to Daniel, Daniel, I'm not finished with uh, the Jewish people. I'm not finished with them yet. This prophecy is about specifically then Israel. Now, all the prophecies in Daniel up until this point have been about Gentile nations. However, this prophecy will be about Daniel, and, 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 or excuse me, about Israel. Now, if you want to understand Bible prophecy, you must understand God's dealings with Israel. God's dealing with the Jewish people. How is it that even today we're hearing about Israel on the news all the time? They always seem, seem to be a hotbed of activity there, the center of attention. It's, it's as if world events revolve around what happens in Israel. The, the people of Israel, the Jewish people, are a people of destiny. God's blueprint for what he's going to do in the world really centers around them. But now let's talk about the place again in verse 24, upon thy people and upon the holy city, he says. What is the holy city referred to here? Daniel was living in Babylon at that time, but that's not the city God's referring to. When he refers to the holy city, he certainly isn't referring to Babylon. There were two major cities in the Bible that got a lot of attention. One was Jerusalem, the other was Babylon. We see them in Scripture all the time. Jerusalem was the city of peace. Babylon was the city of war. Jerusalem is mentioned most in the Bible uh, out of cities. Babylon is mentioned second most. Jerusalem is the place where God's temple was built. Babylon is the place where man's tower was built. Jerusalem is compared to a chaste bride. Babylon is compared to a great harlot. Jerusalem is eternal. There'll be a new Jerusalem. Babylon will be destroyed by God. So he's certainly not talking about Babylon here. Of course, when he talks about the holy city, he is talking about Jerusalem. I believe that that city is the most important city on the face of the earth with reference to God completing his plan, the, the consuming plan that is yet to come in the future. And by the way, the prophet Zechariah also speaks about this. In Zechariah chapter 12, verse number 3, God says, And in that day I, will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people, all that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth shall be gathered together against it. Seems like we're seeing that right now. People gather together against it, and yet 
Zechariah also says, And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from, before, from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of the tabernacles. God's people will survive. Jerusalem will survive. It will become the glory center of the world. That is where the Messiah will reign one day. That is why we pray for the peace of Jerusalem as the Bible tells us to pray. So we see the prayer and the prophecy, the period, the people in the place, and now the purpose. Because what we see in verse 24, we just read it, there are basically six goals that God has things that he wants to complete before this 490-year period is done. Six things that God wants to do. And as we look at verse number 24, the first three, I think they were fulfilled at Christ's first coming, and the second three will be fulfilled at Christ's second coming. Now, what are they? To finish transgression, with the word finish, kala, to end, to bring to an end. I think this speaks of Christ's work on the cross it was on the cross was the beginning of the end for sin. We're talking about sin in general. It was given a fatal blow there at the cross. But then to make an end of sins, we see in verse number 24, this means that sin will be done away with individually. Previously, it was speaking about sin in general. Here, I think it's speaking about sin specifically. It's the word associated with divine judgment, to judge it with finality. And again, that is what took place at the cross, and then to make reconciliation for iniquity. Reconciliation is the Hebrew word kapar, atonement, or we could say expiation, or to bring satisfaction to the wrath of God the Father for sin, atonement. All of that took place there at the cross. And so these first three purposes spoken of, I think, pertain to the cross, and in principle, they were fulfilled there at the cross. But then to bring in everlasting righteousness, this is speaking about a righteousness for the people of Israel that has not yet happened to the nation of Israel. They don't dwell in everlasting righteousness right now, not yet. To seal up the vision and prophecy simply means that there'll be no more need for vision and prophecy. And I think, again, this will be fulfilled at the coming of Christ. And to anoint the most holy. What is the most holy? Every time this expression is used in the Old Testament, over 30 times, it always is with reference to the holy place, the holy of holies, to anoint the holy place, the holy of holies. I think that this will happen again when Christ comes. Eternal righteousness will be ushered in for the nation of Israel. Prophecy and visions will be no more. The holy of holies will be anointed. But then I want to, here's the thing I want to zero in on. All of that was introduction for the prophecy. We have to get the context of it. The, perp, the program. The question is, when does this 77s begin, or when does the 490-year period begin? And this is something that I think the Magi knew, and I think that this was their reference point when it came time for them to come looking for the Messiah. Look at verse number 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. And so the Gabriel tells Daniel, Daniel, know this. That is, pay special attention, Daniel. Pay attention. I want to say the same thing to you here this morning. Pay attention. Don't let your mind gather wool. Follow me now through this prophecy. I want you to understand this. Notice again verse um, 25, because the text divides the 77s into groups. First, the seven weeks of 49, that's 49 years, and then 62 weeks, that would be 340, or 400, excuse me, 34 years. You add those two together, that's 483 years. When, however, does this begin? When does it start? And the answer to that question the Bible tells us the answer right here in verse number 25. It says that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. That is to say, that will be um, 483 years. But the first part, it begins with the command to rebuild Jerusalem. Now, the question is, when was that command given? 
And we don't have to wonder because the Bible tells us. It is found in Nehemiah, just write down in your margin, Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. You remember in that story, Nehemiah was the cupbearer to King Artaxerxes, and one day he was, he was sad in his countenance, which was a dangerous thing to do in the, countenance of a, or in the presence of the king to have your countenance sad. And, and the king was wondering, Nehemiah, why are you this way? And he said, well, because of why shouldn't I be when Jerusalem is in ruins and my people are scattered? And, and, uh, and it was there that the king gave Nehemiah the official permission to go and rebuild the city of Jerusalem. In Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 8, it says, And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. That is, Artaxerxes made the decree at that moment to go and rebuild the city of Jerusalem. That was, scholars tell us, that was on the month of Nisan, which is March, the 14th day, 445 B.C. That began the clock. That began the 490 years. That was the commencement of the count on March 14th, 445 B.C. Then there's the construction of the city. It tells us in verse 25, the first seven weeks or the first 49 years, God said the city of Jerusalem is going to be rebuilt. And indeed it was. We don't have time to get into all the details, but if you look in the book of Nehemiah and Ezra, it was built. It says, even in troublous times, that's exactly what happened. Even though there was opposition, enemies against the people, the Jews, they were still able to complete that purpose and rebuild the city of Jerusalem under that tremendous opposition. And they did it by 396 B.C. It was done at the end of that 49-year period. The city was rebuilt, the temple established. We could also say the canon of the Old Testament scripture was complete during that time. This was a very foundational time spiritually for the nation of Israel. But then again, here's what I want to zero in on, the coming of the Christ. It says, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah, the prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. Again, we see the first significant period of 49 years. It began on March 14th, 445 B.C., and then begins the second period of 62 weeks. And again, the total number of years is 483 years. And so this prophecy basically tells us that the Messiah would present himself to the people 483 years from the decree to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. Now, here's another question we have to ask ourselves. When does Jesus present himself officially as the Messiah to the people of Israel? Well, again, the scripture tells us that would be on Palm Sunday when Jesus rode into Jerusalem. That was the only time in his ministry that Jesus actually planned and promoted a public demonstration. Up until that time, he would say, you know, it's not my time. It's not my time. He would do a miracle, and people would want to noise it abroad, and he would say, it's not my time. Uh, he did a miracle for his mother, Mary, and she, and, and, and she wanted to, uh, you know, pub publish that, and he said to her, mine hour is not yet come. Over and over again, we hear Jesus say that. But in John 12, 23, Jesus said this, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. He said that right before he rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. It was there that he presented himself officially as the Messiah. Now, here's what's fascinating. Many years ago, a man by the name of Sir Robert Anderson of Scotland Yards wrote the classic book called The Coming Prince. And he did more research on this than any man alive. And he understood that in a Jewish year, it was 360 days. And so he calculated the number of days from the decree of Artaxerxes until Jesus the Messiah officially presented himself to the people. And the total number of days is 173,880 days. From March the 14th, 445 B.C., he counted out 173,880 days, and he landed upon April the 6th, A.D. 32. Did you know that was the very day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem? The exact day that he wrote in. That's how precise God is. 
the very day. That's, by the way, the reason why Jesus, when he rode in to Jerusalem on that day, the Bible says he wept. Why? Because he knew that the people, that Israel, had rejected him pretty much, except for a small remnant. They rejected him, and Jesus wept. And in Luke chapter 19, verse 42, it says, If thou hast known even thou at least this thy day, if only you, had under, you would understand that this is the day. This is the day that was prophesied about the Messiah coming. It had been prophesied many hundreds of years before, down to the very day. Jesus came on time. He died on time. He rose on time. And you can best believe that he's coming back, coming back again on time, beloved, just like the Bible says. Now, the question is, what does this have to do with the birth of Jesus and the wise men knowing the time? Well, the wise men knew Daniel's prophecy. And they also no doubt knew when the clock started ticking. And they also understood that the Messiah would begin his ministry when he was fully mature, that is 30 years of age in the Hebrew and in most ancient customs in order to carry out a ministry and a mission you had to be of age 30 years old. In fact, according to the Old Testament, priests could not begin their ministry until they were 30 years old. Using Daniel's prophecy as a point of reference, they could do the math and they could know the approximate time of when the Messiah would be born. But they had other help. What other help did they have? Josephus, the Jewish historian, wrote that around the time of the birth of Jesus, there was a great messianic expectation in the ancient world. This was, this was what was in the air. The, the people kind of got the understanding that it's getting close to the Messiah, the coming of the Messiah. In fact, you remember the story of a man named Simeon recorded in Luke chapter 2? He was an old man, very righteous and devout. He was waiting for, the Bible says, the consolation of Israel, the coming of the Messiah. Why? Because God told him through the Holy Spirit that he would not die until he had seen with his own eyes the Messiah. And he was an old man, so he knew that it was close. And of course, indeed, that did happen. But there was something else that the wise men had that helped them. You have to understand, they were astrologers as well, and they studied the stars, and they looked up one day and saw a star that was unlike any star that they had ever seen before, a star that acted and behaved unlike any star that they had ever seen before. And in Matthew chapter 2, it says that when they came to Jerusalem, it says this in verse 2, they came saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east. Perhaps they also knew that Old Testament prophecy about the star in the book of Numbers chapter 24. But I think more specifically, they looked up and they saw this star that guided them. Notice they call it his star. And if you read closely in Matthew chapter 2, it appears that only the Magi were able to see this star. And it seems like it would appear in disappear and then reappear. When they come to Jerusalem, they're asking about the baby Messiah that is to be born. They were looking for this child, and it seems like in verse 9 of that chapter that it disappeared, and then they were able to pick it up, and it reappeared, and the Bible says they rejoiced because they were able to see the star again, and the star led them all the way to Bethlehem, which is only really about five miles away from Jerusalem. And then it led them not just to the city of Bethlehem, but the Bible says it led them to the very place where Jesus was. Now, that's a kind of different star if you ask me. I don't see stars doing that today. Leading not just to the very city, Bethlehem, really not a city, a small town, and to the very place. Now, you might have heard me speak about this before. I believe that the star there was the Shekinah glory of God. Because we read about the Shekinah glory of God in the Old Testament, how it would appear and reappear, and it led the Jews through the wilderness, and they knew that God was there at the tabernacle when the glory cloud was right above it. And they said, you say, well, then why do they use the word star? Well, the word star simply means shining forth. And it looked like to them a star. They're using the language of observation. But one thing is for sure, they knew it was of God. And it led them to the very place where Christ was to be born 
All of this is amazing. But so, so, so together with the star and this amazing prophecy, the wise men were able to know the first coming of the Messiah. And again, beloved, just as sure as Jesus came the first time, he will come again. This one prophecy alone, I think, should really prove to any honest skeptic that the Bible is the Word of God and that Jesus is the Son of God. There was a man by the name of Leonard Kahn. He was a European rabbi. He studied this prophecy of Daniel recorded here in chapter 9. And on the basis of verse 25 and verse 26, he came to the conclusion that the Messiah had already come. And he was puzzled by this. He wanted to know where he was. If the Messiah had come, where is he? And he went to an older rabbi, and the older ra- he asked the older rabbi, listen, I believe that he's come. He showed him this prophecy. He said, I don't know where to go to look for him. And for some reason, the old rabbi said, well, go to New York City. He's probably there. Okay, well, whatever. So Khan sold almost everything he owned. He bought a passage to America seeking the Messiah. He arrived in New York, and he began wandering up and down the streets looking for the Messiah. And one day, he walked past the door of a gospel mission, and he heard people singing gospel songs. He went in, and he sat down in the back of the room, and he heard the preacher get up and preach about Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And Leopold Kahn received Jesus Christ as his Savior at that moment. He found the Messiah. He found Jesus Christ. And soon after that, you know what he did? He bought a stable, he swept it out, he set up some chairs, and he began his own gospel meeting. And that was the first outreach of what is to become the American Board of Mission to the Jews. And it all started because he studied this amazing prophecy. Beloved, the Messiah has come, and his name is Jesus Christ. And he came to die for your sins on the cross and mine, that if you put your faith in his finished work, you can have eternal life and salvation. That's what Christmas is all about, finding the true Messiah. Have you found him? You can right now if you haven't. Let's bow for prayer together. Father, thank you for the amazing prophecy of Daniel. Again, it just strengthens our faith. We know that this is the Word of God. We know that Jesus is the Son of God, the true Messiah. And I pray, Lord, if there's someone here that's never trusted him, that today would be the day of their salvation. That, Lord, you would open their eyes, help them to see that Jesus is our only hope. Our only hope is in Jesus. And friend, if you're here and you've never put your faith in Christ, would you be willing today to say, yes, I believe, I believe. I believe that he is the Christ. I believe that he is the Messiah prophesied in the Old Testament that came to Bethlehem so many years ago. He lived a perfect life, fulfilled all of the righteousness of the law, and died on a cruel cross because he, becoming obedient to death, took our sin debt upon himself and paid the price for our sins so that we might have eternal life. Salvation is a gift purchased by Jesus Christ. You receive it by faith. And friend, if you'll just reach out today to Christ and say, yes, Jesus, I believe, I trust you as Savior and Lord. Friend, he will save you today. You're going to have eternal life. Anyone here say, that's my prayer, that's what my desire is. I want to trust Jesus. How many of you can say with a hand lifted and praise to God, I have found the Messiah, Jesus Christ. I know him as my Savior. Would you lift your hand? Everyone here that can say that? Friend, if you can't say that with absolute certainty, I'm inviting you now to call upon Christ as your Savior and your Lord. Father, bless these words to hearing hearts today. We pray in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.